Hello, and welcome to the Digital Workspace Works podcast. I'm Ryan Purvis, your host, supported by our producer Heather Bicknell. In this series, you'll hear stories and opinions from experts in the field, stories from the front lines, the problems they face and how they solve them, the areas they're focused on from technology, people and processes, to the approaches they took that will help you to get to the scripts for the digital workspace inner workings. Hey Ryan, doing well. Happy uh, 20 some episodes. Yes, 20. That's, that's true. Uh, 20, 20 and 2020. Kind of catchy. Yeah, yeah we made it. So um, we, we were discussing how we, what we would do for this episode. And uh, the idea I had, and I'll be honest, I started from another podcast completely unrelated, um, was to look at the Star Trek captains and how they would be applied or, or which one would you want to lead your digital workspace initiative? Um, where I heard this from was actually in one of the baseball ones that I listened to. They were comparing Benjamin Sisko, which is one of the captains, to your stable, if you want to build something in one place, kind of captain. Now, I don't want to say plot along, but but he's that guy that that um, you go to just to bring stability. Um, we'll call it digging to him a little bit further, but, but he was, they were sort of bringing him up because he's the only Star Trek captain in the future that really talks about baseball in a good light. <laughs> Bad light. Um, and it's true. I mean, I, I remember, you know, those episodes from DS9 were, were quite cool. But um, we've got this list. I think they've, they've noted 11 captains. Um, and we could probably start from, from the 11th, which is probably the newest, which is Captain Philippa Georgia. Uh, of the mirror universe. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, so I guess a bit of context is that I am not uh, very familiar with Star Trek, but of course, Ryan is super familiar. Um, <laughs> and I've read this Welcher article about all of the captains. So um, I'm basing all of my takes on the descriptions outlined here. Um, I did actually catch an episode of Deep Space Nine on the vacation I just took. We just had cable on, which is kind of a novelty because we don't have it at home one night. And um, there was a Star Trek episode and I was like, OK, this is this is fate. I need to do it. <laughs> I need to learn what this is all about. So I think it was a super random episode. It was about um, uh, what's the captain's name in that one? That's good. Yeah. Um, his son going on his first date and his alien friend. I don't remember his name who messes it up for him. Oh man, he's a. Oh. It's not like spork, you say, but it's like something like that. No, you know? It's no, like a one it's, word. It's Quark's, it's Quark's son. Oh, yeah. Is yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah, it's okay. it's funny. I'm, I've watched every single episode of every series except for the original series, um, and I'm trying to do the original series right now, but it is killing me. Mm. It is so bad to watch. I don't know how I, I must be. I might get a bit struck by lightning by the, the Star Trek gods, but I just find the acting is so terrible. The stories are clever, but the, the acting is just so bad. Yeah, it's yeah. And maybe it's wrong to go from the more modern ones back to the, the originals, but I will finish them. That's, that's, <laughs> Completionist. That's my fair. Right. So let, let's start off with this this Captain Philip and Georgia. So have you watched Discovery at all? Nope. So Discovery is is the newest uh, series or, or themed, um, and what's what's you know quite common with with each of these different spinoffs is that they have a sort of the canon they keep to, and then they, they obviously flavor it up differently. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, the first season of of Discovery I thought was terrible. Um, it was a really like far away from the Star Trek. Besides calling it Star Trek, you wouldn't have actually thought it was much of Star Trek. Um, it was that bad. And then they sort of took it, took it out of, you know, they changed like some of the main characters, like the Klingons into a very different type of, um, but it betrayed them very differently, which, which for me always seemed to ruin it because you're kind of used to a certain way of seeing the Klingons. And then you see them this different way. I was like constantly going, that's not how they look. That's not how they talk. That's, you know, very, very, um, weird, but it, it's gotten better in season two. Um, but they started off with this one and they, and they've called it the mirror universe. Um, and that's because, this this series is a lot more about um, interdimensional travel as opposed to just um, in one dimension where everything's happening. 
So she's in the mirror universe. She is the exact polar opposite of the other captain, um, which is from the, the sort of main, let's say the main universe. Uh, and I don't, don't give away too much of the plot, but because it is, it is worth watching because they, they actually quite cleverly did this, but, but she's basically a tyrannical leader where if you do something wrong, she'll kill you. Um, you know, no, no, uh, no sympathy, no, no empathy, none of those sort of things. Darth Vader. <laughs> yeah, so probably not the one you want. Um, you know, so, so you know, re- I'm reading Dune as well. It's it's that kind of she's like our Conan sort of. Will, you know, to teach people a lesson, we'll just kill five five people so they know that we we feel nothing. So definitely not one you'd want to go with. Um, so murderous tyrant would be the classification. So we'd probably say she's definitely out. Yeah. Um, so the next captain is is uh, Gabriel Luca. Um, so the interesting thing about him is he's actually uh, blind to an extent, which is really the first, I mean, besides, you know, the odd character here, the first time a captain has been put in a position where he can't function fully, let's say, Um but he he's also kind of one of those what I would almost call the politician type captain where uh, but but not not out for for the best of the crew but more out for the best of his own agenda ends up being in the end up finding out as things go he's more and more of a bad guy and if you think about some of these projects that you go on you got this the person who's leading it and and after a while you either you you're either deciding that they are that they are driving it for the right reasons or they are they're really screwing it up badly, and, and you're trying to find out why, and you realise that actually they screwed up. They screwed up on purpose because they actually wanted something else to happen, and they deliberately made these moves so they could do another move. Um, yeah. So, so I don't know if you had any thoughts based on what you read. Well, I did like you know. The, so the article. So this article is is framed in who would you want to be your boss, which is a little bit. Yeah. And I think you know what we're doing is who would you want to sort of lead your digital workspace. So. Yeah. Similar but different. Um, but I did, you know, they did point out that he wouldn't be a boring boss. So, you know, <laughs> you'd at least have the, <laughs> you'd be kept on your toes, I guess. You'd have that factor. So uh, that that counts for something, right? Well, well he does remind me of a, of a boss I had many years ago who who would do these zigzags. Mm. And, and you think you've agreed something and then the next day there's a new plan because something's changed and they're trying to, Zig and zag. So, so yeah, definitely not boring, but definitely not the kind of, you know, when you when you're doing a big transformation and moving people into like, you know, from physical to VDI, you definitely want someone that's a bit more level-headed, that, that that's working to a plan and thinking things through and all that kind of stuff, and really driving the vision. Mm-hmm. Um, so the next one, and this is there's there's Captain Christopher Pike. Now I think he's referenced twice in this article. Um, just want to make sure that that is. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, this is original series one. Yeah, so this this is um, an interesting one because he only really a- appeared in a few episodes. Um, in fact, the, the actor that plays Pike, if I remember correctly, was supposed to be Kirk, and they didn't really like his um, presence on the stage, if you like. So they ended up with Shatner. Um, but he, yeah, he is. Um, also a bit of an interesting one because he's portrayed in different series with different characteristics. So if we look at the at, at the original series one, um, he did the, the pilots and then he did uh, sort of an episode later on. He always comes back as, as a really um, respectful, get, you know, got an air of authority, get things done, but probably a hard person to work for. If that makes any sense, or work with. Um, that's probably why he didn't really get the the vibe you want out of out of the series. Yeah, yep. I mean, the article kind of calls him a Debbie Downer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I would agree with that. And you think it, it comes back to the complexity of, of what you're trying to do, and you want someone that um, is not always going to tell you how why it's going to be so difficult and so hard to do and it's so complicated. You want someone who's going to say, actually, yeah, it's complicated, but we can solve it by doing this and that and keep it simple and, and you know, let's solve this problem on the whole. And I think that's that's the thing is he, he kind of makes everything feel big and ominous, whereas it's supposed to be you know, little small things. Um, yeah. 
we, we then get to Captain Jonathan Archer, which, which is probably one of my favourite captains. This this goes, this one's played by Scott Bakula. Uh, those who ever watched Quantum Leap and, and that sort of thing. Um, what was nice about this series is this is all pre Captain Kirk. So this is like the first Enterprise or the first Starship going out from Earth uh, with warp drive capability and that on missions. Um, so this is someone that's going in the great unknown and having to deal with aliens for the first time and all that kind of stuff, which is if you're in a greenfield environment and you're trying to run this project, you need someone who, you know, is is prepared to be adventurous um, and also roll with the punches per se. Uh, pretty good series, actually. I mean, it was there was four of them. Uh, it was actually sad they cancelled it because it was really, really, really good. But he's he's pretty well balanced. And he's, you know, if, if we look at the previous ones, He's definitely not murderous, and he's definitely not a Debbie Downer, um, and he's pretty diplomatic, uh, and he's probably the first of the captain that, that is diplomatic um, to the point of uh, not shooting from the hip, you know, reasonable, uh, plays politics pretty well. And and when you're doing these these projects, when we talk about politics, we're not talking about necessarily you know Donald Trump versus you know Joe Biden or, or you know pick your president versus whoever. We're talking about someone that can read the room. And, and try and find compromises to to solve the problem. And when you're dealing with the business from a technology point of view, it's a lot about that. It's it's trying to understand the business's reservations, getting them to part with with the investment to to do the project, um, and then also to adopt the the solution that they should be part of the, the 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 process in deciding on to an extent, and then you know getting on board with it. So if we talk again about the 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 physical to virtual move, or even today where everyone's been forced now to to use to technology like Zoom and Teams and and work remotely. Traditionally, that's always been pushed down the priority list because the agendas were well, we have all these offices, people must be in them, uh, and having the ability to work remote is great for those that have to be on the road. Uh, and now everyone's on the road in theory. Yeah, I like that. You know, the article describes him as chill and. I feel like, you know, based on what I've gotten out of this, that he could potentially uh, be someone who might lead with empathy. I mean, they make a note about how he spends um, a night in sick bay hanging out with his um, sick dog instead of like attending to his duties, which um, I feel like just reveals a nice human side that, you know, maybe uh, would inform his leadership style. Yeah, he's definitely that kind of guy. Um, you know, sort of prepared to, as much as an adventure is also prepared to to hang out and and you know shoot the breeze if that's what that's what people need. Um, but in the same token, you know, just put his foot down if he has to. Um, so that's why it's probably one of the one of the captains I like like the most. Um, we then uh, we get into number seven, which is the. the Captain James C. Kirk, but the Chris Pine one. So this is the reboot Kirk. Um, pretty good, I thought, as, as, a, as, as a replacement for um, William Shatner, um, who, I'll be honest, I only really enjoyed in the movies, not so much in the original series. Um, but he's he is your quintessential, brilliant, never-say-die personality, will fight till the, till the last minute, which... You know, in some projects, it, it does need to be like that. Um, and and he, in, in a lot of senses, will lead by example. Uh, and, and I've worked for some CIOs like that and, and with some people like that, and, th- and they are the best ones to have around you sometimes because they will not just tell you what should happen, but they'll do it, they'll do it with you and, and build re- reputation and trust that way. And, and specifically when it comes to running out new technology, you need someone to, to take the – the bull by the horns and 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 make it uh, sort of you know drive that out of the possible with the the art of it's mm-hmm. it's right in front of it works um so yeah i would say pretty pretty uh pretty fun in the sense of it'll be you know high speed high pace get it done mentality but also driven by um bringing everyone on the journey to to get to the desired result which is a successful project Mm-hmm. Not afraid of innovation, you might say. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, see if there's anything I didn't really cover that might be cool. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, he makes the manga comedy here. He's a little bit less rough edges um, as as the movies have gone on, and I, I tend to agree with that. But but he also, um, again, I'll give away the plots of those movies if people haven't seen them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he starts off being a criminal in the first movie to being the captain of the Enterprise, which is the flagship. You know, so so you could almost say um, one of those people you bring into you bring into chaos to sort out. And, and get back on track. Mm-hmm. Um, we then go to the, the Kirk that, that Shatner. So, I mean, the article says you're probably better off working for this Shatner than, than the, the previous one, probably from a maturity point of view. But I'd almost say that's how the series was written. Because um, I almost, if you watch the original series, it feels like you're watching a, a play as opposed to TV. It's very theori- theori- uh, theatrical. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but I like this comment, prepare to work hard and maybe die, but do you feel like you're part of a mission that could change the universe for the better? And, and, I've, and I have seen that in some organizations where I remember getting an email from a very high, I think he was one of the CIOs, saying, what we do here is life or death. And you kind of look and go, well, it's important, but it's not life or death. You know? Yeah. Let's, let's have some perspective. Maybe someone who would have a hard time separating life and work. Well, in some of those organizations, it is like that. I mean, there is an mm-hmm. expectation that the, that the work is is the is the everything. Um, you know, working long hours. You know, being totally committed, putting your family aside, all that kind of stuff. I don't know if that's still the case in some of those places, but it was definitely like that when I worked for them. Um, mm-hmm. And it's all consuming, uh, which it also becomes a bit of a drug. You kind of get used to it, and you kind of enjoy the. Um, the, the speed of it um, but I would probably say in, in this case when it comes to you know this is the this is the, the battle hardened program manager that you work with that's done this 10 times before and and makes you feel comfortable that he knows what he's doing meanwhile he's got no clue and he's going running you know shooting from the hip um, and, and if you and if he loses a few people along the way he's okay with that as long as he gets to the result um, but he's but in this and as I say he's he's, he's willing to put himself in harm's way as well. But as the TV series goes, the captain hardly ever dies. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. It's always the guy with the red shirt. Yeah, as it says, the, the, would he be a good boss, but would he be a good lead for your thing? Chances are you love working for Kirk up to the moment he got you killed. I think that's pretty, that's pretty apt. Right. Maybe at a young, hungry stage in your career where you can take a few falls still. Well, well but that's that's exactly it. I think, and, and, and depending on where you are in your career, I think you would do that. I th- you know, because these sorts of programs and projects are those big ones that um, do tend to change the organization. And I, and I have seen that in some organizations where, where people have joined the project team and they literally said, oh, I just want to work on this project because this is like, this is a big thing in the, in the game. Like everyone knows about it and reputation and whatever. And then in six months' time, you look around and go, what happened to that person? I know oh, they weren't good enough, they're gone. Um, and you kind of feel a little bit, oof, feel bad for you. But that that is sometimes, it is, I don't say cutthroat, but, but there they can be that kind of project where there's no time for, it's not a training project. It's a, you know, tight deadlines, you know, tight budgets, deliver as much as you can, far, as faster than you, than you think possible. So... Cool. Next one, Captain Philippa Georgia in the Prime Universe. Okay, so this is the the opposite of the um, um, the Mirror Universe. Um, they say collegial, collegial. I can't even pronounce that word, but firm. Um, so she's probably one of the f- stranger captains that they've had, because, or stranger roles they have. Because in this series, you've got this captain, and then you've got Michael Burnham, who's the first officer. Now, Michael Burnham. It's not, not actually a male, it's a female. And she is a human that grew up in the Vulcan culture. Now, if you don't know anything about that, basically Vulcans have lock all the emotions away um, and they're very logical. So she has this no, no emotion approach. And actually, she, the, the actress plays this really well. But, but you're never sure who's actually in charge um, in the first season, or at least that's how I remember it. Um, but she, but she, uh, she does. I mean, as the captain goes, we're talking about Captain Georgia now. She does tend to listen, make good decisions. You know, gives everyone a shot. But then, you know, when she puts her 
stamp on it, then the stamp is on. You know, that's what we're doing. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like this captain, did she not, I, was there not as much um, screen time for her? She kind of got backstabbed, so. Yeah, she, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the season, it was a while longer when I watched it, but basically I think she gets killed somewhere along the line. Yeah. Uh, and and this is where the other captain, uh, the guy, comes in um, sort of to take over. And then you have the Mirror Universe one come in as well. And that's and there's this crossover between dimensions and and she comes in. So she doesn't get sort of written out. She just comes back in and plays a new character. Mm. Um, but, but you know, generally speaking, she was she was pretty good. Uh, and, and, and one of those leads that you'd want to have that, that's going to get you there. But I would say at a at a um, at a moderate pace, you know, slow and steady. Do this, do this, do this, do this. Then we'll get there. As opposed to, you know, some some cap leaders will come in or captains, and they'll drive it. And if we do it in two weeks, why can't we do it in one week? Mm-hmm. You know that sort of thing. Right. Next one is the yeah. So this is number four, Captain Benjamin Cisco. So as I said, this is one of my favourites. Um, so he is basically shafted in a way and put on this this space station um, next to a wormhole. Um, it's a highly political area, multiple factions, um, you know, a lot of history, and and he has to navigate those politics while basically putting the space station back into into use. Um, and and the, as as the guys in the baseball sort of episode said, you know, he's the guy you, you you're really relying on to build the base, build the foundation, then build the next layer, then build the next layer, and then hold it all together. Whereas you know sometimes you have a a leader come in and they're just just there to do the change, you know, make make this thing happen, and then they hand it over to an operations team, and then they go off and do something else. Um, whereas this is this is someone that that is changing everything, but also owning what he's changing. Um, pretty pretty firm. Um, very, very diplomatic, very hard and nego- hard negotiate, I would think. Um, but pretty good guy. Um, you know, kind of goes from fire to fire, cleaning up, putting out, you know, stabilizing things. Um, but yeah, definitely one of those those guys you want to work for again and again and again. Yeah, the article uh, says he's got a lot, a lot on his plate. Um, <laughs> a very inspiring diplomatic leader. Um, I thought it was interesting too the the pointing out the shades of moral grayness that he has to deal with. So, um, you know, I think maybe not morally all the time, but there are decisions, right, where it's not clear one, you know, one way or the other. There can be a lot of complicating factors. So I think the ability to take all of that into account and then, you know, make the best informed decision possible is a really important leadership skill and not get, um, you know, to consider the uh, decision, but not get uh, lost in it. Yeah, and 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 that's very very similar to how, how a lot of these projects run. You've got you got a lot of knowns, but you have many unknowns. Uh, I mean, if you look at, uh, we'll keep to go to the example of, of moving physical to VDI. Um, when you design that and you put it in place, you're designing it for for not necessarily the entire organization to use the VDI platform initially. You know, you're going to build it over time and you know, have a, a, a BCP or business continuity plan that says a certain amount of capacity will be available to roll over to, you know, that sort of thing. But if you look at it now in the middle of a pandemic, you need all that capacity because most of those users that were going into the office to go work on a desktop or, or whatever have now to work from home. So they need to get into that, that VDI infrastructure, which means your BCP becomes production and your production is still production. Um, so, so you've got to have, you know, strong hands on the wheel for that. And also you might be, have to build out new, new capability because you don't necessarily have enough capacity or you have to change your capacity to meet the need because you, you depend on where you are in your, in your cycle. Um, and then that's, that's dealing with the unknown and being able to handle it and potentially, you know, selling the, the that sort of, or I wouldn't say sell that vision, but, but when you're talking to the business about investing in that, you almost have to sketch that you've thought about that sort of stuff, even though the, the, the likelihood, you know, a year ago would have been it's never going to happen to we've just gone through it, you know, mm-hmm. or we at the moment. Um, 
but yeah, I, I, I would definitely say this is one that I'd want to work with. Um, and then we have uh, another pike, number three. So this one is really a cameo in this in the Discovery series. Uh, and it's actually talk now of a spin-off series for him. Um, and he was in the movies as well, not this actor per se, but, but the Pike character, because the original captain of the Enterprise was Pike, and he hands it over to Kirk, uh, both in the series and in the movies. Um, and Spock was the first officer of both. And I don't think Spock's actually on this list, but Spock should also be considered. We'll, we'll maybe add him as a bonus. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think he's, uh, you know, typically, as, as we said, you know, pretty well balanced guy, very commanding, um, you know, very direct, very hard on, on on people below him and getting things done and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, they describe him as a cool camp counselor who, uh, as long as people follow the rules and listen to his orders, he'll be yeah. their friend. Yeah. Yeah. Do what I tell you to do and we're all fun. Don't do that. Don't do what I tell you to do and then, then you'll meet the wrath of, of, of uh, not Khan, but that's that's a bad pun. Um, yeah, I mean, he's, he is like that. And, and um, yeah, I mean, he, they, they don't really say he's, he's, he's uptight. I think he's uptight compared to the other captains. Um, but I also think he's, he'd like Picard is next and Janeway also, also quite good teachers. So they tend to to do something maybe harsh to teach the the person a lesson to improve. Where I didn't, and Cisco does that as well, actually. To be fair, um, and that's maybe why those series were the best because they they were very teachable. You know, it's almost educational watching it sometimes. Um, right. So then we get to Picard, who's number two. I mean, we we talked about you watching the Picard series. Did you ever get a chance to watch it? I have it, but now I mean. How, how, Picard manages like a benevolent but firm god, so it's <laughs> a selling point. <laughs> well, it's it's funny because I was when I went over to this list the first time, and we were talking about this on the Slack group. I mean, I um, I was actually surprised that he was he was number two until I saw who number one was. And actually, when I when I saw who number one, I was like, yeah, that's that's exactly how I would see it. So maybe just talking about the series again. So you've got you've got Enterprise, which is pre Kirk, then you got Kirk. And in the same sort of universe as Kirk, kind of, is Picard and Janeway, and Janeway's one. Because um, they're all sort of in the same time frame, but even though each series is kind of different in, in, in the sort of technology and this, all that kind of stuff. Um, but he, the, the, he was interviewed, and the reason why he was selected as, to, to play this role is because of his Shakespearean background, because he was a Shakespeare actor. And he can really pronounce and orate and stuff. And, and and going back to, you know, what kind of leader would he be for your project? I mean, he is the awe-inspiring person. I mean, when he, I mean, if you look at the amount of memes on the internet with Picard saying something, he is that kind of guy. Um, but he he does something which I don't think many other captains did really well, is he surrounds himself with a lot of diversity. So he has a very strong first officer to IC. Um which in the other series, besides maybe Kirk with Spock and, and Burnham with um, with Georgia, you don't necessarily see that strong first officer. Um, well, you see them, but they're, but they're the main actor. But then, then you sort of expand out into the circle of, of characters, and they kind of get a bit weaker the further you get away from the first officer. Whereas with Picard in his, ser- in his season, um, yeah, his series, he's got a strong first officer, he's got a telepath for a counselor, He's got a very strong weapons officer who's a Klingon, so so you know very aggressive kind of guy, um, and then he's got a first um, a, a young guy, Wesley Crusher, who he basically brings up from being a teenager into uh, an officer on the deck on, on the bridge. So so you see all those dimensions. So very much you know lead for lead, pull the best people together, get the best people to operate and do the stuff. Um, and then find the the young guy to bring up and and, and educate at the same time. So the really really, really all rounded um, leader, uh, which is what you really want when you're running a big program, where that's going to be multi year and, and going to you know really change the business. Yeah, I think being able to build a strong team is a really important leadership quality, um, and not you know 
and then and setting the organization up for that long term, longer term success by having individuals with a lot of strengths. And, you know, if one person leaves or, you know, if something happens, you know, others are empowered to pick up the slack and it's not, um, well, you know, too well, top yeah. down. And that's the interesting thing. So, so if he he so he completes the picture in the sense that if he walks away, then any any of his team could take over, mm-hmm. and you can see that comfort and and you know they naturally are, are prepared for it. As opposed to in some of the cases, if if Spock wasn't there, there wouldn't be anybody really after Kirk to 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 drive things. I mean, you know, there's there are people that probably could try, but you wouldn't feel that same confidence. At least I wouldn't feel that same confidence. So he's definitely one of the stronger ones, and 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 also known as probably the, the go-to guy for diplomacy with complicated um, situations, um, which is why you need to watch the series Picard uh, and read the book. Okay, <laughs> which one first is more important? Uh, I, I would I would honestly say if you if you really want to do it properly, I would watch the I would watch the series, the, not the not the Picard series. I'd watch the Next Generation series. Then I would read the book, and then I would watch the Picard series. Um, now, the Picard series is not completely linked to the Next Generation series, but there are pieces where, you're, where if you haven't watched that series, you'd be like, I don't really understand this. I'm not sure why yeah. this, that kind of thing. I've taken, I've taken a note. <laughs> I'll add it to my to-do so It's only like, uh, I don't know, about seven seasons of... 20 episodes each. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I think that's what's, I mean, it's like, it's one of these things like Star Trek, you know, it's, it's whole universe, which, you know, once you get into it, it's like, yes, there's so much content I can consume. It's like never ending. I mean, you're still watching the original series. It's like, you know, there's so much to dive into, but getting into it as a newbie is, is a little overwhelming. I'll be honest, the only way I watch series is, is if I'm working. So, like, if, if we weren't doing this and I was working, you know, iPad would be up, it'll be running while I'm working, and I'll be like, oh, that's interesting, Karen working. Oh, that's interesting, Karen working. Otherwise, it's, it's too much time to to invest. Yeah, I mean, that's. I guess that's my problem is I can't – I need to be, like – laser focused i love like silence when i'm working i just like if i could just be like in a soundproof room with like zero distractions that's where i do my best work so it's hard for me to you know then make time it's like you know i feel like i've been working you know i work a long day i make dinner and i crash (laughs) it's like that's that's the pattern basically (laughs) maybe i play play 15 minutes of animal crossing yeah well that's the problem you waste time in silly games Listen. Yeah, 50, yeah. Well, <laughs> silly games. Come on, that's been like my quarantine therapy, <laughs> my meditation. Yeah, I'll admit that when I get into a series like this, I'll binge it. So it'll be, you know, while I'm while I'm making coffee in the morning, it's what I'm watching a little bit, and while I'm, you know, doing something else, it'll be on the background. So that's the only way I find to get through it. Is you got to make it part of your other stuff. See. Um, right. So now we get to number one. Uh, so this is Catherine Janeway. Now, um, this is, uh, as I say, uh, all the other episodes, all the other seasons um, have been based on the Enterprise as the ship, um, barring DS9, which was on a space station, and then Discovery, which was, uh, well, that was the other ship, the Discovery ship. Um, so Voyager is is her ship. Um, and what's really interesting about this season, the series, which is what made it so cool, is that they were basically thrown 70,000 light years away from their normal space. So they call it the Delta Quadrant, the Alpha Quadrant where they work, and then there's the Delta Quadrant. So, you know, completely out of their their known environment, and they have to get back home. And, you know, in order to do that, she's, you know, all these other captains have had the benefit of leveraging relationships they have alliances that they have, knowledge of the vessels they have to deal with, the, the competitive landscape, if you like. But picture if you basically, you know, if you worked in the UK, for example, running projects and that, and I, and then you got sent off to go work in the Middle East or in Asia, and you know no one, and you have to run this project. This is the kind of position, you know, she was in. Um, and, and, and part of that was also she, when they got thrown out, into this other quadrant, 
she didn't have a full crew. Um, she actually had a bunch of, um, well, she had a limit, half her crew, and I think she had about 25 rebels that they were actually tracking. And she had to merge this crew now with the rebels and her crew together to make one crew. And that's one of the under sort of themes of this. Now, going back to sort of a project, it's, it's the same as in some cases where you've got your IT team or your, your, your project team, which is made up of your company staff. But now you've got a vendor that's doing all the work for you or is part of the team. And that vendor is obviously trying to, at the same time, fight against the, not fight against, but but they're trying to, you know, make more money out of it. They're trying to build more. They're trying to oversell, under-engine, whatever, whatever those things are, all those dynamics that are constantly happening. And and she has to sort of navigate that whilst traveling through a new environment where she knows no one, making alliances and, and not making, and undoing alliances and, and protecting her vessel, which has got all this technology that no one else in that quadrant has, which obviously makes it prime, um, which in the same sense for a project, you would be protecting your investment in, in the route you're going. Um, so yeah, definitely one of the, I mean, one of my favorite se- series where I've watched a, a lot because I've enjoyed her her way of handling. And I think Kate McGraw, who, who plays her, um, does a fantastic job of playing it. By the end of the season, by the end of the series, you almost just don't want it to end because you enjoy that, um, her way uh, of things. Um, so she's, she's definitely, definitely tough. Um, you know, I would probably, and I probably agree with the statement, you know, would be the sort of, sort of leader that you might complain about behind your back. But she's also the one you end up naming your first child after. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely, definitely hardcore. Definitely, you know, top top uh, achiever, um, and and leads by example. But also expects you know your absolute best at all times. There's there's no you know I don't give you you know you've, you've always going to perform would, would be the sort of underlying message. Um, but she does listen, um, which is always a key key skill when you when you're running these sorts of programs, project. You listen to everything to make good decisions and then drive those decisions. Yeah, I, I think you really hit on all the key points. I think the amount of you know compromising and the ability to to do that and to bring those disparate groups together um, can be a really important quality. I think you pointed out, you know, it can be the the vendor and IT kind of relationship, the, you know, or the partnership there, the um, push and pull. I think also sometimes within organizations, you know, these huge silos get thrown up where, you know, maybe you're building something for another or you're, you know, helping procure some software for another part of the business. You know, I think even internally, sometimes there can be sort of those competing, um, you know, desires or um, sort of, um, you know, one group needs it done this way, but there are restrictions where the other group is sort of gatekeeping, you know, you know, we still need to keep things like security and, you know, legal stuff or whatever it is in mind. So even internally, there can be a great need for, um, you know, hearing all sides and mm. coming out with uh, the best decision to move forward. Yeah. And it's something that we probably have kept glazed over and haven't said, I mean, one of the things that I've always appreciated about the, the, and it's most sci-fi series, funny enough, is is there's always good diversity. So there's never a, a sort of white only or a, or a black only or, or anything of that nature. It's always pretty clear um, or pretty pretty even and fair. Um, and the same from a sexist point of view. There's there's very little, you know, you've got female captains, you've got male captains, you've got, you know, it, it doesn't really, none of that stuff really matters, which is the kind of universe you want to live in where, you know, if the best people are doing the, the right things. Um, and even in, in her in her series, she does have a bit of that problem where her first officer, who's the head of the the, the rebel outfit, um, he he sort of buys into the fact that that he needs to work with her and, and being the first officer's best position. But his crew, which is made up of both male and female, want him to be in charge because he's the male, and and also because they don't want to work for her because she's a female, and 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 they handle it really well through the seasons as you go along. Um, but it would be very much the same as what we deal with nowadays with, with um, you know, the Black Lives Matter and and even just equal pay, you know, for for both ma- for females to be, you know, according to male roles. Um, so it's a good, it's a good 
part of, of the Star Trek world, and Star Wars does it to an extent, but, but Star Trek definitely does it a lot better uh, in that sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then the last thing was the bonus one, which was Spock. Um, and the reason why I don't think they listed as a captain, because he probably wasn't captain for very long, but but he actually was, he's, he, he ends up captaining a lot, a lot of the time on his own, his own vessels and stuff like that. Um, so if you look at the reboot episode, reboot movie Star Trek, he has left Starfleet and he's now on his own mission and he's literally captaining his own vessel. But he has in, in, in the Starfleet world, captain as well. But he is your ultimate logical analytic person who, you know, give me the data, we'll make a decision and then whatever's logical is what we're going to do. Um, but because he's half human, every so often he's unpredictable. Um, which, which I would say he gets better the more unpredictable he gets, mm-hmm. um, which is where, you know, Leonard Nimoy, who, who played him through the movies and the, and the original series, and uh, Zachary Quinto, who played him in the new movies, both really played well, um, where you always got the sense that he was, he was predictable, trustworthy, reliable, and then every so often you would throw in this little catalyst that you go, holy cow, that was really cool. I didn't, you know, I never thought you would do that. Or, and these are key, you know, movie points that actually make you really uh, enamored. And that's, you know, when you look at running a project sometimes or, or, or transformation, you need someone often that is predictable and is reliable and whatever, but can spot that moment to be, um, to, to change it up and, and do something that just reignites the, the project or, or get the momentum back or, or saves the day uh, in a sense. Yeah, I think uh, from what it sounds like, I think, you know, being able to be analytical and use data to make decisions is super important and in driving projects along, but it's not necessarily what, um, you know, inspires people to do their best work. So I think, yeah, having that that quality, um, that, that humanness, if you will, um, coupled with, you know, making good decisions because of actual reasons is, is a really good uh, leadership quality. Yeah. So out of these, I mean, did you, did any of these sort of, when you read through it, that jump out as you as, as, as a jump out to you, at least as, a, as someone you'd want to see running a project for you or being, being the lead? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, I might be predictable because they put her at number one on the list and also um, Catherine Janeway. Uh, my sister's name is Catherine. It's spelled the same way. So there's another bias there. <laughs> but um, I think just uh, she she really appealed to me just that, um, you know, the the boss that um, is so um, maybe maybe to like tough love kind of, but is so yeah. like good at getting things done that she really like stays with you for a long time and really. Um, to me, still being sort of, you know, earlier in my career, I think having, you know, working with, you know, experts and having people to learn from and um, to really like push me to to drive me further. Um, I guess those are some of the qualities that, that I would look for um, in someone to lead up a, a project. Yeah, and I think that's that's the common thread if we look at all these captains i mean what what is what makes them what are the best characteristics i think i think there's an ability to to listen actively um to discern from what what they're getting to to give guidance on what the right decision is sometimes they actually don't make the decision which which i think you don't see in the the tv shows as much but i think in in real life it doesn't always have to be the project lead or, or the leader making the decisions i think it's 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 a balancing act to allow your teams to to self-organize and, and, and make decisions, provided they know where they're going, um, which is really that guidance and, and that counsel. Um, and then there's that being accountable, you know, whatever the, those decisions are, whatever the team has been led to go and do. Well, the priority is slightly, I can see the priority is going to change. Let me make sure that my teams aren't shocked by it so that they, they can um, adapt, you know, within the execution. Definitely. So, so who would you pick, Ryan, as your your project um, leader? So, well, it would depend on the project. Um, I, I think there's 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 circumstances that I pick one or the other. So, you know, if I look at at the projects I've been involved in that are really successful, um, 
it's been a Janeway or a Picard or a Archer kind of captain who are well reasoned. They know they, they know what they want, and they, but they're prepared to listen and and drive those through. But then they also once once we have made that decision, and that's that's the route we're going until the information changes, and then we have to make new just you know new decisions. Um, and they back themselves in those circumstances. When you're in a um, sort of you've you've done all the hard work and you and you've made that change, and now you're going to plot along and, and, and build on it, build on the base, then I'd probably go with Cisco, um, because then it's 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 a different mindset to the firefighting and the addressing the um, the growth that you need to through organic means as opposed to project means. Um, and then that's, I mean, the, the rest I, I kind of feel like are, are copies of those main character, main, main captains, but not as, as awe inspiring if, if you like. Mm. Um, so. Yeah. I think there's something to be said for that, you know, that ability to inspire and, um, yeah. And excite your team. So, yeah. I, and, and excitement is good. I mean, it's not not like every day must be a, you know, fun must be a roller coaster fun day where you're going to yeah. be now. But it, but it's at least fun, you know realizing or noticing when there's a bit of uh, you know a bit of motivation that's gone out and you need to rekindle it or you know no one likes to do this no one so no one but most people don't like to do the same routine thing every day. Um, so stimulating that sort of thing would be important. Um, yeah, and, and I think that's where, you know, going back to the ones that teach whilst also driving home, you know, what the uh, what the vision is and where, where we're going to are, are the best ones. Have you ever watched Below Deck? Mm-mm. Oh, my God, that's an even better series to watch. <laughs> <laughs> more more so, Star Trek? Or? No, no, this is completely different. So this is uh, reality TV, uh-huh. um, and, I, and I love watching it because it, it is – human behavior at its best. And I mean, most of these projects, it's, it's not about the technology. Um, in fact, the technology, I mean, I'm not going to say it's simple, but but people are, um, you know, the the, the, the the technology, you know, you, you can you can build it and, and, it's, and it's pretty simple in the sense that it either works or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, then there's, there's, there's steps you can take to make it work. But in the end, it's ones and zeros. It's going to work or it's not going to work. But the human side of it is far more complicated. Mm-hmm. And and so Below Deck I really enjoy because it's it's all about a crew on a, on a mega yacht, so your $20 million mega yacht, and they do a season, so six weeks you know, in the Caribbean or the Mediterranean, which is what I'm watching now. And you basically see how – and these are people that are thrown together – very much like any project we would do in, in a digital transformation necessarily. They've got a captain who basically is accountable for the boat. Um, and then you've got your your outdoor crew, which is your deckhands and, and that that are you know, putting out the toys and wiping down the outside and doing the dockings and all that kind of stuff. And then you have your interior crew, which are your um, stewardesses or stewards that are doing the food and uh, well, they deliver, they're servicing for food and drinks. They they're cleaning up the boat for from you know making the beds and doing the washing and all that kind of stuff. And then you have a chef. Okay, and then and that and that's what you see for the for the TV series. And of course, you have an engineer and you have a first officer, but they don't typically feature in the show too much. But you watch the the dynamic of this crew having to work together through these charters. So they have a charter of of one night, two two nights, or three nights, depending on the on the person paying for it. And, and these people are paying, you know. Uh, anywhere between one hundred fifty thousand and two hundred thousand dollars for the week to rent the boat, with you know all their food, all their drink, all that included. And it's, you know it's guests of you know six to ten people. Um, and then you got you watch how the crew has to you know look after the guests while at the same time you see all the politics and the you know the infighting whatever. But the reason why I enjoy watching it is is is, it is I think there's a lot of leadership lessons in there when you're watching. And when you're sitting with my wife watching it and you sort of say, okay, and you see how this this thing is happening and you're like, holy cow, you know, I can't believe that they're letting that, that get it, the guy get away with it. Um, and you watch someone who, who will lie blatantly to the captain. You're like, does this guy not realize that this, is, this has been recorded? 
it's, it's we've got to amp up the drama for no, reality but, TV. But they, they, they do it fantastically in that sense i mean it is it is highly addictive to watch i mean we'll watch because they don't not one episode is one charter that you know there could be three episodes for one charter so you you have to watch the next one to see what happens but what's interesting is at the end of the season they do the reunion sort of meet up and they and they've all had to watch the series before they do the reunion and then because the, while the stuff's all going on you're getting like the captain's view like in the situation you know the chef wasn't following the preference sheet for the for the customer and and that's a fireable offense um and then, you know, on the, on the reunion show, they're sort of talking through it again and saying, if I'd known that he'd lied to me about what he said he had done, then I would have fired him. But I've also got to balance the fact that if I fire my chef, I'm going to find a new chef, and I'm in the middle of the med, in the middle of the season, you know, what chef am I going to get? You know, is it the devil I know, is it, or, or do I take the risk? And, 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 you, and you see between, um, and then again, it's two different captains because I've watched two different seasons now, you see how the two different captains approach it. And the one that pulls out his phone and goes, and you see him making the phone call, said, okay, great, so I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, I'll get on a plane tomorrow and I'll see you, whatever. And he's going back to his crew going, well, I've got a new chef arriving in two days' time. Who can cook? <laughs> you know, because one chef's left, you know, it's, and it's and it's how they address it. It's just, it, it, it's weird how, I'll say weird, but it, it's, it's, it's such a, a, what we've been through now, the, I'm comparing the same two captains to the same thing, and you said you get the one that's a totally teaching captain, and she's fantastic, um, and you got an old school sea dog, who's who's consistently saying this is not a training vessel. This is you come here trained, you know. I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to monocoddle you to get through the the season, mm-hmm. but I'm going to watch and make sure it happens. And it's those two different approaches, so it's worth if you've got some time to watch, but you be warned, it's very addictive. <laughs> Sounds very interesting. I like it's kind of parallel to Star Trek too. You know, you have a captain on a vessel and they're out, you know, exploring, you know, the waters or the sky or the well, it's, space. It's so funny because so there's a, there's a, there's a, a guest that comes on and he's some penny penny stock millionaire billionaire whatever made up made a fortune of money and there is in the middle of the Caribbean and he's more interested in the Wi-Fi connectivity which is over satellite so he can do his trades. Than being on this vessel, you know, taking a break and, and whatever it is, and I mean that's what they kind of say. Like you know, you're on this vessel in the middle of middle of this wonderful ocean. I mean, it's flat ocean, beautiful scenery, etc. And you're worried about that stuff. And then you have the, another guy who's never missed a football game for his favorite team, sitting in the med, trying to watch this game, which is at three o'clock in the morning in the med, and they can't stream it because the satellite obviously doesn't have the bandwidth to push it down. Um, and, and how he, I want to say freaks out, but, but, you know, you can see how visibly upset he gets because he can't watch the show, watch the game. And then he only gets audio. So he's kind of watching audio, but he's, it's, it's you know, it's just, it's just bizarre. Some of, the, how some of these guys are. Well, um, this was a, a super fun episode and, um, I'm so excited that we've we've reached this milestone of 20 episodes. Um, it's not for you know, it's no small feat. So, well, well, I'm sure we surpassed the average. I think I think there's many podcasts that, that start and don't go don't go past 10. Let alone Definitely. 20. I mean, it's something. I mean, maybe we'll do a podcast about about this one day. But it's something that I think is uh, they're not, you know anyone can really start one, but I think the commitment to, to keep one going and to find new topics to talk about, new people to interview, you know, just continue the momentum of it. Um, especially, you know, when you're starting out as a small unknown podcast and you're not, yeah, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people give up too soon or, you know, it's not no, you're right. I mean, if, if you look at the Facebook groups and that, that that's what I, I watch. I don't really contribute to it, but I watch them a lot. And you see the biggest, the biggest sort of lesson is, or well, the, the, the hardest thing to do, which is the biggest lesson. You got to, you got to be consistent. Um, and there are, there are some podcasts that that, that don't follow a, a routine or a pattern. And, and every so often, you see the episode come out because they, they finally caught up and they've done the hour and a half thing. But those are the same guys that maybe have six other series that they're doing. Mm-hmm. And this, that's almost a fun one. Um, 
Yeah. But this one I've enjoyed because we have talked to people that are different um, and given us insights that that, that I think are quite educational. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to keep it going. Yeah. Well, thank you for all your help because you make it happen. No. So do you. So it's a team effort. Good stuff. Um, cool. And I guess if, if anyone wants to join us uh, for more of this conversation or tell us who they're um, who they'd like as their Star Trek uh, captain, um, they can join us over in our in our Slack channel. Well, either, either that or they could tell us how they disagree. Yeah. Because I think, sure. that would, I, you know, or, or if there's a better series we should be watching that, that gives a better um, analogy for, for doing digital projects. Yeah. Be great. Would be interested to know. So we'll put a link to uh, to sign up for that uh, digital workspace work Slack community in the episode notes. If you're interested in uh, having conversations. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Heather Bicknell is our producer and editor. Thank you, Heather, for your hard work on this episode. Please subscribe to the series and rate us on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Follow us on Twitter at the DWW Podcast. The show notes and transcripts will be available on the website, www.digitalworkspace.works. Please also visit our website, www.digitalworkspace.works, and subscribe to our newsletter. And lastly, if you found this episode useful, please share with your friends or colleagues.